All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. You want to turn it on? Thank you for joining us for another wonderful lecture. Uh, tonight, one of Moa's dear, dear friends, a longtime member, volunteer, board member, Rich Douglas, will be uh, presenting us on the origins of different fibers and textiles and explaining about how one, how a thread is turned into textile. Um, many of you have most likely heard or even been to Douglas Fabrics. So he will be uh, talking a little bit about his family's business. I know that my family has really close ties to um, your family's business. I was just talking to my mom about it last night, and she said that she spent endless hours in Douglas Fabrics, and that was like her place to go to, <laughs> and it was like her home, so she really loved to be in there. Um, so we are incredibly lucky to have you. Um, so let's give a round of applause for Rich Douglas today. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, very much. A lot of familiar faces. Thank you for coming. And uh, okay. hopefully it doesn't get too boring because a lot of things within the lecture is, you got it? I think you need to talk more closely to it. There you go. Test it. Is it okay? Good? Okay. Um, but uh, it's the, uh, ooh, where am I now? Here we go. The being in Douglas, in the family and being in town, born, raised in Palo Alto, uh, I am a true native. And uh, you don't run across too many of us now and everything. But uh, hopefully it won't get too boring and too statistical, but, and, uh, but that, but I, hopefully it'll be entertaining and uh, a learning part of it so that you can understand how really fabrics are put together and how they're made. So here we go. My lecture this evening will give you a better understanding of how fabrics developed over time. And fabrics uh, all are uh, within our lives all the time. When we wear, we wear it, wash it, dry it, sleep in it and etc. Many things that we can do with fabrics, draperies and cushions, whatever. Makeup of different fibers, forms from plants, insects, animals, and man-made. It is such a diverse subject, I can only hope and hit the high, high points. I have been out of, I have been out of the selling yardage uh, for over 30 years. And that, so it's uh, one of the things that, uh, it's been a long time in, in going over the, you know, going getting back into it, but I'm still servicing sewing machines. Uh, beginning into how we started, a little bit of history. My mother came to Palo Alto in about 1918 with her family, mother, father, and three siblings, Harry, Louise, my mother, Gertrude, and Alex. Her father was a, he made cigars and he rolled cigars in front of Lady Coates Market in the window, and in the front windows of Lady Coates Market. My mother worked at the fountain there. My father came from Arkansas to work with his uncle, Jim Herod, in San Francisco at the farmer's market, sewing, uh, selling sewing machines in about 1923 or 24 is when he came. Then they moved to Palo Alto and set up the, the shop behind Mills the Florist, a type of store with Singer was a class C shop. And they were, uh, brought machines in on commission. They sold the machine cash or gave the uh, contract back to Singer. They would collect the money. And if they didn't collect the money, dad had to go out and get it for him. 
father met mother at the fountain in Lydicotes, and then the romance started. It was on. They married in July 19, 1926, and in 1929, my brother, Don, came in to being, and I came in in 1931. Now that tells you how old I am now. The Depression was on. It started in 1929, and times were getting hard. In 1936, my Uncle Jim left the store to do other things, and I don't want to tell you what they were. Well, I can. He's gone now, but he, he had a slot machine run in the Santa Clara Valley behind the, behind, in the back room. <laughs> so, to do other things, and that was the things. Dad and mother continued selling the sewing machines, and with that, and during the depression was, was hard, but living was, living was hard, but they made out and made it work. In 1938, they built a home on South Court in Palo Alto, way back with nothing but open fields around it at that time, one house beside it. And who lived in the house was the Alpagars. And the Alpagars, little side thing, the Alpagars, he, Bert, was a very, very good friend of Jack London's. And he told us many stories about that at the time. And they, then they built the house on South Court, a two stories Cape Cod colonial home. And, uh, and it cost a whopping, a little bit less than $6,000 at the time. Now that was in 1938. Back in 1935, when they still living in the little house and they built the house in front of the little house that they had in the back, which was actually an old chicken coop that they moved into. In 1935, the Singer Featherweight, which we have a model of right over there, came into being, and Mother loved that machine, and she, she sold a lot of them. Singer came then back to her one time and said, would you stop selling those? We sell other machines, too. Oh, but she kept on in that uh, mom's... In 1941, of course, World War II came about, stayed in business, and then we had, Dad had, uh, had acquired, and every time a machine came to, you know, offered in that, it was a singer, uh, it was a portable, and a lot of them were singers, little model uh, 99s and 66 models, which were just basic portable, straight stitch. Some of them didn't even have a reverse on them. But we had between 80 and 90 of those during the war years, and we could only rent them for $5 a month. So mom made buttonholes at 20 cents a piece for people that need to have them done. She did hand work and things of that nature during the war. We kept no machines to sell. And uh, so, and we couldn't raise the price on anything because of the OPA, Office of Price Administration. One of the nice things that dad did was to keep these sewing machines at the uh, Red Cross in Palo Alto, and I think that was at the beginning of University Avenue, and I think that's where uh, MacArthur Park is now, in that, in that building. But he did get accommodation from either the War Department or FDR for keeping the machines up and keep going without any charge. But then, uh, I don't know exactly when in the 30s, but they moved onto University Avenue, and they moved in with a uh, another business that was in there, which was the uh, O.E. Rosenberry had the typewriter business there. And so it was two separate businesses within the same uh, store. One was for sewing machines on one side, one side was the fabrics. And that lasted until I think it was about 1943 or 44, there was what they called the country kitchen. It was uh, it was run by the Balajos and uh, family. It was a country kitchen, and it got on fire, 
damaged some things in the store, but they couldn't keep business there. And in, uh, and they moved to 382 University Avenue, both of them together, and stayed there until 1949 with the sewing machine sales and service and that. War was over in 1945. Singer came into Palo Alto and set up a company store. And they asked my dad to be the manager of it. And dad said, no, thank you. I want to be on my own. And so they brought in their own store there. And dad set up business and got within, still within 382 University. Um, he got the domestic sewing machine line from the white sewing machine, white, the manufacturing company that sold white sewing machines. But that did not last long because right about 1947, Leon Jolson imported the Nicky sewing machine. And the Nicky came out with a model BF, which was a straight stitch machine, and the model BU, which is the first zigzag machine to be introduced in the United States to be sold to the general public. So we were beginning of a lot of things that we did was the beginning of a lot of things in the economy and the sewing industry at that time. In 1948, we also got the Ilna sewing line. The Ilna number one, which I think the people call it today, they collect them, called the grasshopper. And the, uh, and th those were made in Switzerland. A much lighter machine made of aluminum and magnesium. The neck sewing machine is made out of cast iron, much heavier. So they were compatible. A home machine that could be put into a cabinet, sit, stay there. Or the Elna, which, can, which they considered 18 pounds lightweight at that time. And the full carrying weight of it was 29 pounds with the case, which is all metal. In 1946, here's where it really starts in. In 1946, mother got a call from her, from her sister Gertrude, who had moved down to LA, gotten married, and they, she had a lot of friends that were in the manufacturing business. In fact, one of the businesses was Tabak of California way back then, and he was the one that came out with the original pedal pushers. So, and Gertrude asked mom if she would like to be in the fabric business. And they, and she thought, and she said, well, why not? So we got into the fabric business. Now, the fabrics that they were again wanting to sell, mother, was sample cuts and mill ends. Sample cuts is where a designer will take and present to manufacturers their design of, uh, of what they want to sell. A lot of them were prints, plaids, whatever, checks, but the, a lot of majority of them were prints and of different all types of fabric. I remember one time we got a print in that it was all yellow background, bright canary background, and it had black printing on it. And all it said in the printing in different languages with the word look. Well, I had a, a, a good way of using machines, like uh, the fabric like that. Nobody wanted it. So there was, uh, I had a lot of uh, nice people that made shirts for me. And one was uh, Dorothy Gibbons. And Dorothy actually was the sister of Art Adams, which I think a lot of you knew from the museum here. And that's so, a little sideline here and there. Uh, and I wore it to high school at the time. Don't forget about that. I was only 14, 15, 16 years old at that time, but I had a lot of fun. And uh, so I had the pictures, but sample cuts, getting back to the subject, uh, was and the, where sample cuts came in, and they were just in three, four, five yard lengths, just enough for the manufacturer to make a garment to see how it would be. And then the mill ends, of course, is what they had been running that line and where they might cut off a piece of yardage and where it had a, a flaw in it. 
and, during, and with the flaw, they would take it out. In the manufacturing business, you, you try not to have flaws within, otherwise you can't sell it. It's it being knots or uh, misprints or whatever you have on that. But the thing there is, is that mother said, well, why not go into the fabric business? Because right after the war, nobody had anything because we'd been in the war uh, for, what is it, four, almost four years. And in doing so, the home front didn't have anything. We just kept going, keeping things going for the guys overseas and everything. And when mother got the fabrics in, when we had, but that, let me get it back a little bit. Remember the house we built in 1938 on South Court? Well, we had the opportunity to buy the house, a house on Hamilton Street, which is in the business district. And in doing so, Mother said that would be a great opportunity to have living in downtown and having a business property and look what we can do with it. Well, it was an argument between mother and dad, but mother won out, naturally. And what happened then was that we sold the house on South Court, $16,000, and bought the house on Hamilton Street for $16,000. So it's a good trade. And that, and we went into business and selling fabrics. The, the, the thing there is that as nobody really had too much of fabrics and everything, and when they sent, when we bought the three, three or four big cartons, and I mean big cartons, they were probably 24, if not bigger, square, and about six feet long to accommodate the rolls. And we got in a lot of those, but when put up the sign, as you can see in the back there, we had the house on Hamilton, which is a picture of with fabric shop on it. And we set up shop there. We got everything lined up, tables and everything, put a price on it. And in doing so, the first people that came in, it was like, well, bargain day. <laughs> the uh, she damn near sold out of everything that first time, and that because nobody had any fabrics at, at all. So she sold out, made some money. Hey, give us some more. So then just some more, and she got in with different people and that. And about that time, we went to I think it was Butterick Pattern Company, and trying to set up things in business to going into business with selling fabrics and notions and that. So what happened was she called up Butterick and asked him, would you please sell, it, sell us your pattern so we can sell them for you? They said, well, what do you mean sell it? We only sell to department stores. And that's what you usually got the fabrics and everything from your notions with department stores. So we set it up in the front room. I helped her to the, and they said, okay, your credit looks good. So we'll send you a line of, of, of patterns. And I helped set it up for her and everything, and set a lot of things up in that for her. So from there, uh, let's see, where are we here? I'm getting off track here. Um, uh, so, okay. Uh, bought the house on Hamilton Street, set things up in business, business in there, but after about two years of that, people got used to having fabric going to, back to the department stores. Everything began getting into normal. And in doing so, things sort of fell off in business there you know, on Hamilton. And so what happened was in 1949, we had a chance to go to a store on University Avenue. And that was at 420 University Avenue. And that was, I think, Craig's paint store is where we, they were moving out. We moved in. And we set up a shop there of having a complete sewing center and the first of its kind in the US. Being that, we had Douglas Fabrics sewing machines and patterns, notions, uh, sale service of, of uh, machines and repair and everything. 
And actually, when you come down to it, we had one of the first of its kind of a privately owned sewing machine and a full sewing center. I would say the first of its kind in the U.S. itself in 1949. And so it's, uh, we, we helped start things a little bit. And Singer came in to us a few months later and they looked and other people came in. And then there was, um, what was his name? The over in Menlo Park, he began to come in. And, the, and the, then 1956, 57, the, um, uh, from the Stanford Shopping Center opened up. So things sort of fell down a little bit, but going on to University Avenue, we got more traffic, getting everything together, and we were fairly well set up at that point as to being, and that with the going in that from 420 University Avenue, giving you a little history of time element there. And in 1949, and then in 1958, we moved to 379 University Avenue, bigger store, better, and a little better location, a little better foot traffic at that time. From that, we moved down to 355 University Avenue, from 420 to 379 to 4 355. When we, we moved into 355 um, University, we did a, a, a store switch, meaning that there was the waterbed place at 355. And so they moved out, we moved in, and then they moved into 379. So, and it was uh, and the, and with that, so let's see now, where are we here? Yeah, but that that in itself is where the history of how Douglas Fabrics and that got started in Palo Alto and became quite, I guess, an institution of people coming in for the fabrics and notions and uh, with and everything. So that uh, it made a good business for both Don and I in, in the in, in, I'm living on it. But there's like Joanne's Fabrics today. Uh, it all started with us way back when, but today's fabrics and that, the shops are dwindling because of the fact that people are getting more things online and getting a lot of things that would be uh, normally, uh, the, especially in California when Prop 13 went in, you would have the, uh, the schools didn't have the money because of the, uh, the Prop 13 from the uh, state taxes and the residential taxes on it. But that that is what happens. And the only people that are doing any business now are the quilters in the business of, of fabrics. But that is what the, the that is what has happened with the fabric business now. But uh, my my brother and I and that and my mother went up through 1995 is when we finally closed up shop in Palo Alto. And that is, I think, any questions about the history in that? Anything? I know a lot of you ladies and parents, we were actually selling third generation sewing machines in Palo Alto. Yes? When did you guys start working in shop? Well, if you would say, when I was about 14, 15, when I was with my mother over in the house, having her set up everything, I was going to high school and my brother was going to high school at the time and that, but I, I was always helping her. I actually, when we moved over to University Avenue, uh, I, set up, I set up all of the accounting system for us in, in the shop at the time. And I my brother would be taking care of the um, fabrics and the notion of the uh, uh, fashion fabrics and I'd be taking care of the basic fabrics and the notions, and also repairing machines and everything within the store. And that, so, yes. Did anybody sew in your, did anybody learn sew? So, like, that's what I ended up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 
That's my, that's my, that's my youngest daughter, Marlene, and the next door is Kathleen. Yeah. And if they had any questions, they would ask me. What the the lessons? Yeah. It, just teach them how to use the machines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and teaching them the machines and everything, and that. So, but now let's get into what the actual uh, the discussion is about. In in where's my other one here? Come on now, here we go. That's the one I want here. Got to keep things in order. In that. All righty, years, years ago, history does not tell us when the first woven fabric came about. But about 4,000 years, ago, four to 5,000 years ago, as we found out by digging up the Egyptian mummies and everything, that they were wrapped in linen in a cloth. So it goes back even further than that when the first fabric started. And how it started, I don't know, but the weaving might have come about and getting together sticks, grasses, stalks, palm leaves, and different things of that nature to make baskets or to hold something that you could carry without having to carry it by hand. The fibers of the flax plant, um, of which the fibers come from the flax plant of, for the linen, and the the thing there is is that uh well i'll get into that here the the one thing that all na natural fiber have in common and why i'm always pulling threads from clothes all the time because of the simple fact that everything that you have on and all your clothes fibers have scales i don't know if you knew that or not but they have scales Scales are very similar to maybe little tiny little hooks that hold the fibers and the fabric together. Very fine scales, and they vary as to the, if it's fine, finer fibers, then you have finer scales. And this is why one atta attaches to, to together. The fabric, the fibers are of different sizes, lengths, and the different animals or plants that they come from. Source, plants, cotton, many types of it, flax, hemp, trees. And I just heard recently on the, on the TV, they're selling hoodies that are light, durable, washable, made out of bamboo. And that, so it, things are progressing still. Then insects, of course, silkworms. Animals, sheep, goats, llamas, alpaca, camels, rabbits, vicuna, muskox, and anything that really has fur or hair can be used. Some, though, do not have fibers because it's, the, the hair is too, too hard. And the, like on the wolf, the wolf hair is hollow and it doesn't, nothing will stick to it. it they won't freeze little sideline again. Um, then the length of the fiber makes the world a difference too of how short or long the fibers are. The thing there is is that the longer they are, the stronger they are. But when you get down to the length, the short fiber is between 20 and 25 millimeters. The medium fiber is 25 to 30, long fibers 29 to 34, and then extra long can be up to 40 millimeters in length. And those would probably more or less come from what we call island cotton or Egyptian cotton and the flax plant. The longer the fiber, the stronger the yarn and thread. Terminologies. But how do we get to doing and knowing what we are working with? On the loom, warp, is the length thread or the thread on the loom. The wift or W-E-F-T, wolf whip, is the cross weave horizontal of the loom. Denier, number of threads per inch in both directions. 
They're right here. I'm going to take, and I'm going to pass out a little sample of these. Now, I'm going to put some over here, this side, and try to take and pull the fibers out and to see how fine they are so that you can see what a 700 denier sheeting really is. And it's, uh, it's quite remarkable how they can make things that small and to weave them into a, uh, a cloth that can be strong and be sustainable. Okay, twist. The direction of the thread is wound right or, re or re a reverse twist to card to comb out the wool, and it's like I've got a little thing in the back there, that, but that's most for house, scratching house paint off of, but it's the same idea like a needle board. I don't know if any of you have used a needle board for, uh, for velvet and, and ironing velvet and that type of thing, but it's with a, where you can straighten, pull the, pull the needles or the comb through the fibers, take out whatever is the foreign matter from it, take out any seeds for that within it, and to separate and so that you got a nice clean piece of fiber or like cotton. Put that in the terminology of it. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting into some of the things that it's pretty hard to explain. The plant or animal fibers into yarn dates back to ancient times when people fashioned primitive spindles out of sticks. Around 500 BC, the spinning wheel was born in India. Today's factories have fully automated spinning machines that work on the same principle as the spinning wheel. This is a two-ply commercial yarn, the kind factories use to weave fabric for making jeans and tops. It's made from large bales of raw cotton. Cotton comes from a plant, so naturally, some leaves and stems are mixed in with the cotton fibers. To remove them, the first machine passes over the bales and removes a 5 millimeter layer of cotton, then sends it through a duct system to the blending and cleaning machine. That machine processes 500 kilograms of cotton per hour. The cotton comes out evenly blended and cleaner, but still not clean enough. So it goes into a second cleaning machine, which finishes the job. Now the cotton goes through what's called a carding machine. It has huge rollers with wire teeth. They comb out the tangled fibers and line them up in parallel rows. The machine also discards any fibers that are too short to process. Next stop, the coiler. This device takes the rows of fibers and forms them into a thick and loose first stage yarn called sliver. The slivers move on to the drawing machine. It lines them up six at a time and draws them out, stretching them to form a second stage yarn. Then a machine called a roving frame stretches this second stage yarn, strengthening it by thinning it out until it looks like this. This third stage yarn is called roving. Depending on the type of yarn they're making, it's anywhere from three and a half to 16 times thinner than sliver. They now stretch the roving up to 30 times thinner, which strengthens it even more. The yarn is finally finished. Now they have to transfer the yarn from all these small spools onto huge industrial size cones, 20 spools to a cone. One transfer method uses the winding machine. 
It winds the yarn from the first spool onto the cone. Then it automatically takes the back end of that yarn and attaches it with a knot to the front end of yarn from the next spool. It winds it onto the cone, then attaches the back end to the front end from the next spool, and so on. As each spool empties, the machine automatically discards it. And while all that winding's going on, the machine's optical sensor, that white object you see crossing the screen, does a quality control check. If a portion of yarn doesn't meet specifications, the winding stops, the machine cuts off the offending portion, then reconnects the ends and resumes winding. This is air jet spinning, another method of making yarn from slivers and winding it onto giant spools known as tubes. A suction tube grabs the front end of one spool and connects it to the back end of the previous one, again with a tiny knot. Before fully automated machines like this were invented 50 years ago, all that knotting had to be done by hand. The thin finished yarn is 200 times lighter than the thick first stage yarn that came out of the carding machine. From start to finish, spinning this yarn has taken 48 hours. Now, I think from that, going into the spinning of the yarn, threads, and that over. Uh, a little bit of back history with it. The invention of the cotton gin in 1793 by Eli Whitney helped start the Industrial Revolution. The growing of cotton in the south in the warmer climates and the river power of the north in the northern states made for a good uh, match for our economy. The, uh, there was one other thing here. Where was it? The then flax fiber, oop, and that. Uh, there are all different types of ways you can adjust the threads on a loom to create the weave you desire. Plain weave, single thread, crossing over one another. Then in the, of the warp and the woof. Twill. Left, uh, left threads crossing over several warp threads at once. Well, by manipulating the warp and the woof threads, you can come up with all types of weaves. Broadcloth, which is actually the, the uh, basic cloth for the uh, for prints and that. The percale, which is also basically for the sheeting and the type that it is. Muslin, plaids, gingham, cheesecloth, hairy cloth, corduroy, velvet, velveteen. Now, the thing with velvet and velveteen and corduroy, they have a nap, which is a one-way uh, on, on that. And the nap, actually, uh, I'm not... I'm, Really, I, the way that the nap is formed is by uh, is with the with the knitted uh, with the fibers coming up above the warp threads, and the woof was actually there. And then what they do with the type of threads that they're using or the yarn, they actually cut cut the top of that off so that if there was a loop on it. They would take a razor or that and just cut off the top of it and so that it formed a nice fuzzy little hair on the end of it. Then they would brush that and this is where you get the, the way it's cut is where the nap comes into being on the, on the fabric. Um, one other little thing that I was trying to find here, get too many things. Uh, I know you're in here someplace. Where'd you go? The, oh, come on now, not there, not there. You have the one on uh, 
Joe, you have the uh, for mercerization. The mercerization came about. A third process often used with cotton fibers. Yeah. Called the, mercerizing, which changes the physical appearance of the cotton fiber as well as its properties. With mercerization, the substrate is exposed to a concentrated solution of caustic soda for a period of time and is usually done under tension on a clip chain. As it is mercerized, the cotton fiber changes from a kidney bean shape to a rounder shape. The caustic soda causes the cellulose fiber to swell. As a result, the fiber becomes more open or amorphous rather than crystalline. This enables the fiber to take up more dye which makes mercerization useful when you have issues with color fastness or you have a large amount of immature fiber. Note how the skein on the left, which has been mercerized, has a different appearance than the skein on the right. Not only is mercerized fiber more receptive to dye, the fabric is stronger and it displays a smoother appearance. Because the shape of the fiber has changed, the fabric reflects light more readily and if mercerized under tension, the fabric has more luster. Okay, That's, I finally found it. Um, the mercerization actually came about in 19, 1858 out of England. And with that, as it mentioned, that the fiber is more round, stronger, and will take a dye much better. The thing about uh, early weaving and with the loom and that, a lot of times they had to take a linen thread for the warp, the up and down, as against the wolf going crosswise, because the up and down, uh, the wolf. And, but uh, with the up and down thread using the, the linen fiber, but once the thread was mercerized, it became stronger so that they could use it all together as to the cotton of the warp and the wolf. And with that, the thing too about treating uh, fibers a stronger creased and that dying much better. But the thing that you've got to understand about a lot of things that you make and that like sheeting, the sheeting has a nice sheen to it when you first get it. And in doing so, uh, over a period of time, if you wash your, well, in washing your satin, or anything that has a sheen to it, it's getting duller and duller. And the reason for that is that you probably are using a detergent. And in using a detergent, it will wash that sheen off. So I've been, I, I recommend that you stop using detergent, especially with any of the fabrics that you have that are shiny, nice, and like your sateens and your sheets, and use a mild ivory soap or woolite, which will make in lab making the, the uh, my garment last longer and, and better looking, and still have. And you can have as many washes using your soap or ivory soap or woolite on that. Uh, so with that, we come to silk. Well, silk comes from the cocoon of the silkworm. Janice, if you were here last time with the uh, lecture, Janice Stockard gave a wonderful talk last month on the cultivated silkworm of China and Japan, feeding them the leaves from the white mulberry tree, giving them the white silk, beautiful texture, fine and that. Other Asian countries also produce silk. And it's wild silk, called Tessa silk. And they may mainly eat oak leaves, which are not as tender as the mulberry. So what happens is that the fiber comes out tan or brown and much rougher in texture. And uh, many, many years ago, when I was, I was going over at the Junior Museum, they had at one time some silkworms that they were showing how they got the silk off of it. Well, they, the, the fiber there came out a yellow. Well, a, silk, a silkworm will eat almost anything as long as, he's, as long as he can go eating. And the thing there is, is that 
they, we fed the silkworm at that time lettuce, and it came out and it came out a nice yellow color, but it was still a nice texture with it. The um, the thing there is is that in nineteen about nineteen seventy, the there was a fellow that came into our store. And he said, I've got some tussa or tie silks that I'd like to sell. And in doing so, he was, is in, he was an airline pilot, I believe, for TWA. And he came in and he showed us some nice, beautiful tie silks. And they were made out of the raw silk, tussa silk. And they came in, they were beautiful. But, uh, and he later, we, he got better and put his airlines and he started the exotic silks that in in Los Altos and then distributing to the, the different types of silks and imports from the Asian countries at that time. And that I don't I don't think he's in business any longer. He, and that he was he had his last shop on I think it was on Leghorn in Mountain View is where he was last located. But uh, the mm -hmm. thing about the Tessa silks in that they were made what they call the cottage industry there. And the width of the, fa of the fabrics that he brought in was anywhere from 29 to 39 inches wide. And so we did a good job with it in that. And he brought in also China silk, which is beautiful. And China silk is not too good for, fa for garments, but they're wonderful for linings in, in your garments. And that, so the, from there with the silks and that then we go into uh where is it flax here we go linen thread is from the fiber of the flax stalk not from it's from the stalk of the plant and the fibers are are long 20 to 40 millimeters in length the whole plant is run through rollers and crushed. The stalk and seeds are separated, and the stalks are washed to separate the fibers or the woody fibers away from the um, linen fibers. The seeds are then crushed also, and the seeds actually produce linseed oil, which was the basis for our oil based paints. So it goes in different directions for different things. The flax fibers are washed and combed to get all, all the excess materials off of them and whatever foreign matters might be, and then combed with finer and finer to get the desired size and finish of, of the fibers you're looking for. And they're very strong. I believe that the... Uh, in going back into the 17, 16, 1700s, or even maybe a little before that, when the tapestries were being made in Europe, for the, in, that, in the tapestries where you see in the museums today, a lot of them are made from the um, linen, linen threads that are, especially on the, uh, on the back side, or the warp side, warp on that, and then the, uh, and then cotton, and weaving or to where you can take in that. But the cotton, the, with mercerization of, of your uh, yarns, you, they can take and replace the linen thread from the, from the uh, uh, warp and the woof and have them both, as I mentioned before, with it. But the tapestries were made, a lot of it were made out of linen, but then they could, they had, and the tapestries were fairly good size in, in, in that long, and maybe some of them maybe, maybe 15 feet long in height on that. But they could work from both sides, the front and the back, in weaving whatever they wanted done to it. And there's a lot of them, as you can see, I've seen if you've gone to museums to where, uh, how they can work in making tapestries. Now, the last little thing on here is hemp. The plant is a very similar to flax plant, and the process the same. The fibers are larger, rough, and, and strong, and is used for the 
backing of rugs, heavy, heavy ropes, and burlap. It is also used in the medical field. And then in pleasure, marijuana. That's where it comes from. Now, now let's go into the wool. And wools, there's quite a variety of wools. And I just found out the other day in the, uh, where it has wool here, lamb's wool, merino wool, Jetland wool, cashmere, alpaca, lamb, lamb, uh, uh, lamas, vicuna, and kibbit or covet wool, and then camel, camel's wool. The thing is with alpaca, and vicuna, the the thing there is vicuna, they no longer imp export any of the fibers unless they really go into the country to find out because uh, the, well, here, the vicuna used by the Incas, reserved for use in the royalty of the, uh, for, for its supreme warmth and softness. Due to the concerns over extinction, the Peruvian government closely monitors the production of vicuna. The animal being shorn every other year and not more than five times within their life. But it's limited. The alpaca, the type of wool produced by alpaca, is some of the finest in the world, although the very soft and larger size diameter, the alpaca fibers can become itchy. The llama, of course, is even heavier, and the actual is too tough to be used as a garment worn against the skin. Despite this, it can be used for outerwear as well as decorative pieces such as wall hangings and rugs in that form. But getting back up to the actual wool, the lamb's wool, the soft of its type available, and it is the first shearing of the sheep and it's between six and seven months old. And that's why I call it lamb's wool, because it's the first shearing and it's very soft. Merino wool comes from the merino sheep. The fibers here tend to be uh, finer than normal wool. The fibers have less scales, which makes this type of wool far, too so far softer too. And this is why when I was Dad would put me into clothes that with wool and wearing it to Sunday school, and it was the itchiest thing. <laughs> Remember both my brother and I. Shetland wool, at the same name suggests, the type of wool is taken from the sheep of Shetland Island, Scotland. This type of wool is coarser and more itchy than merino wool and comes from the undercoat of the sheep. Despite this, the type of wool is desirable while uh, while it's still soft. Cashmere. This wool is the undercoat of the cashmere goat with the finest fibers coming from the neck of the goat. Then we have mohair. This includes more wool, which comes from the angora goat, not to be confused with angora wool from the fur of the rabbit, believe it or not. The fibers of this type of wool are thicker than cashmere and are more similar in size of normal sheep, sheep's wool. Vicuna, the wool is, was traditionally used by the Incas, but that we've already gone through. And covet wool comes from the Arctic musk ox of Canada and Alaska. And this, uh, the type of wool there is collected during the molten se molding season where the breeders comb or collect the wool from the ground. This wool type of wool has many benefits in the super fine nature it, it needs. It's extraordinary soft and strong and, and does not shrink when in water. So they all have their, their, their purposes, but I don't think they use very much of the, the muskox except for up in Canada or Alaska. I've never seen it in, in any type of garment here. But then there's camel's wool, is also quite tough. It's suited towards outerwear, especially it has insulating property. The coarsest hair taken from camels is actually used as backing for carpets. And that, so with it. And then,
Yes, I, I have a camel's hair coat myself, but it's a coat outside. You don't wear it next to your skin. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, while I'm on the subject of wolves, about, yeah, when was it? Um, was, uh, last month, April 27th, have you ever been up to the Hidden Valley Ranch? And it's a working ranch. Well, on the 27th the last month, they had their day of sheep shearing. And if you ever can, can to get up there to see that, it's quite quite interesting to see how the whole process is done from the cutting of the wool from the sheep, and then carting it, and then going down to each step with that. Very interesting for her to see that with it. The next thing is cotton. I lay, use this for last because in doing so, it, uh, it it, it actually one of the most used of our staple of the of our fibers, and uh, the cotton. There's different types of cotton, of the Pima, Egyptian, or Sea Island cotton. Now those those fibers that come from that, which is your Pima and Egyptian, and I'm pretty sure that the sample that I gave to you is of the Pima cotton that it was made from. How soft it is. And, uh, from the sheeting. Um, that's why they're fairly expensive, but I got it on sale. Uh, unfortunately, the store we bought it from, which was Bad Beth, Bed, Bad Beth and Beyond, uh, is no longer with us. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. But the Sea Island cotton and Egyptian cotton is very soft, extra long, fine, uniform, flexible, soft to the touch. And uh, it comes from quite all over Peru, Ecuador, China, and, and uh, different places of that. Australia, Israel, and U.S. Yeah, we saw uh, the uh, Sea Island cotton where we have the U.S. cotton here. The upland cotton, which is the most used of any cotton that is grown, is actually cultivated in Brazil, China, Austra Australia, Turkey, Pakistan, and most used in the manufacturing of our cotton cloth today, which is approximately 90% of the market is using the upland cotton in that. And the size of the fiber there is between 20 and 30 millimeters in length. The, um, uh, then there, there's a tree cotton, which is type of, uh, it's uh, on that, but the thing about your, uh, your cotton or the, the it's, the, when they're growing, the cotton is, is being grown. The size of the cotton ball itself is the smaller it is, the shorter the millimeter of the of the fiber. And uh, the tree cotton is it, it, it's not that long, but it, it's very very little use. And the tree cotton it's uh, uh, it, it's very it's not used that much at all with it. Now, okay. There's one other thing here, and then that, and that is how they they use the different materials of the fibers to be blended. Blended fibers are woven or knitted from yarns which have been made by blending two or more, more fibers together before they are spun into yarn. Combination fibers are those which contain two or more different types of fiber. The warp or filling fiber may be blended fiber, and the yarn in the other direction may be a single fiber. Union fibers have warp, warp yarns made of one fiber and filling yarns made of the other. Um, believe it or not, the shirt I'm wearing now is a blend of wool and cotton, and that is the uh, a viella is what this is made from. And that comes mostly from Scotland in that. So, and, it's, uh, and it can be washed in cold water, properly hung in that. But it's a very comfortable and being wool and cotton blend, it breathes. And it, it's, I feel it's one of the better materials to make shirts out of, especially in the, in the fall of the year and during the winter. Uh, another thing, too, I'm just about over with it. You have anything more up there? The what? 
Oh, yeah. When do we show that one and see the industrial looms on it? Back where the back section of that, they had little things coming up and down. That's introducing the different types of thread if they have different colors, and that's where it can be introduced into that with it. Is that it? Okay. Uh, so it's they, they, in your factories, you're, you have looms. Uh, originally, they were probably uh, uh, automatic looms and that, or hand looms, especially with the cottage trade, started in about with about 29 inches wide. Well, now they have looms which are extra wide where you can make 108 inch sheeting for our uh, the uh, queen size and, and uh, queens, king and queen size beds. Um, now, quality. How do you tell quality of different types of, of fabrics and that? Well, you're better department stores. I don't, I don't go by mail-in and that type of thing, but I would say if you go into your better department stores, know the difference between, know the difference and the better manufacturers of the item you want to buy. To get full, to get the feel and see what, you're, what you are buying, uh, it's one of those things that at one time I could take and feel the merchandise, feel a piece of cotton in my hand, and I could tell whether it was all cotton or there was synthetic mixed in with it. And that it's uh, and I don't, I probably I haven't done that in quite quite a few years. But the other day I bought some T-shirts, all by uh, made in cotton, but the T-shirts I bought maybe about ten. Well, about eight or nine years ago, they're nice, soft. The T-shirts I'm getting today, they're supposed to be all 100% cotton, but they're a little rougher on the skin with that. So it's, uh, it, that's why I like to feel the merchandise before I buy. Um, items you want to buy, get to, get to feel and see what you're buying. Pendleton Woolens is still one of the better wool and, and wool that is being put out today. And they put out other things too in the, in the uh, uh, besides wool, but you're, and you're woven fine in that, uh, in, in the texture of it, touch, and the worsted wool, which is actually more tightly woven wools. And that, where the yarn is tight, more tightly woven and, and finer in texture with that. Uh, and it's with all the blends and, and that too. Uh, if you buy items from, say, Amazon, Target, or Walmart, look at the label. Who made it? Where was it made? Care of the item, and how thick or th thin or thick is the material? Some manufacturers used to make the same item in two different grades of fiber. Yeah, exactly the same print, exactly the same type from the same manufacturer, but they would be uh, one would be. Uh, might still be doing that in today, but yet uh, I'm not sure how the manufacturer is, but I know that you can go into maybe a better department store and then go into Target and see the same thing. And the price at Target might be a little bit, will be less, but the quality is not the same because it could be two separate items, two separate types of, of weave that is being put on the same. In closing, I am seeing that the quality of the past is actually being lost to the generation of now. 
This is one great reason that MOA is here today to help preserve the past into the future. I hope that you have learned more about fabrics and how they are put together. It has been my pleasure and uh, to be present here to help you with this. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much. Let's give Rich another round of applause. Thank you. Are you welcome? We really appreciate you being here. Um, we appreciate all your help with the exhibit and providing this lecture. It was really, I learned a lot. Um, please make sure to go see the exhibit inside the um, Threading the Past because some of Rich's items are up there and a lot of his props are there too. Uh, Rich has also provided um, some really cool advertisements, uh, family photos, um, and nice pictures in the back in the snack table as well. So make sure to check those out along with the sewing machines as well. But it was a really great lecture. Um, I am one of those that did not know fi fibers had scales on it. So <laughs> I definitely learned a lot about all the different types of fabrics here. So 